Hello everybody. As you may or may not know, I made a video on the Cold War from a leftist point of view, and it became my most popular video so far. So it's kind of unfortunate that I completely left out South and Central America in that video. Particularly all of the American involvement that went on and the surprising lack of Soviet involvement. So this video will look at what happened in this region between 1948 and 1991. If you're a leftist, you know about the fact that the United States kept starting coups against socialist, or just vaguely leftist, Latin American nations during the Cold War, and they set up dictatorships in order to support the interests of private capitalists. In this video, I will tell you the story of the American interventions in this region, chronologically, country by country, through the entire Cold War, with special emphasis on the suffering it caused in its countries. As such, I will be counting how many people were killed by American involvement. And at the end, we will add it all up and, well, then we'll know, I guess. And I'm fully aware that having a death count will mean my video is 100% demonetized and possibly restricted to some ages or in some regions. That's why at this point I would like to thank my Patreons for paying me so I can make videos that YouTube doesn't like. If you enjoy this video and my channel, please consider donating as well. Of course, I make videos about historical and political topics from a leftist point of view every Sunday either way, if you donate or not. So if that sounds interesting, then why not subscribe? Anyways, it's not always easy to determine how many deaths can be attributed to American interventions. And I fully respect you if you disagree with my methods here. But this is how I am going to reach my numbers. And yes, you are fully allowed to use that YouTube chapter feature to skip the rest of the intro. First of all, if the United States funds a military uprising and the rebels kill 500 people, then I will attribute those deaths to the American intervention. And of course, if the CIA supports a coup and that coup kills people, I will count those people as victims of the American intervention. And if the regime the US propped up kills communists by throwing them out of helicopters, I will also attribute those deaths to America, since if the US hadn't set up the fascist regime, the people wouldn't have been killed by it. Crucially, I will mostly mention coups that succeeded for the sake of time. So if there was an American-sponsored uprising that failed, there is a chance I won't mention it here. Of course, there is a more fundamental issue. How will I go about getting the numbers? There are often large disagreements about how many people died in CIA-sponsored uprisings. The US tends to aim low and the country it happened in tends to aim high unless the US supported regime is still in charge. For this reason, when available, I will take the high and the low estimate and just average them out. This is a very crude method and of course you can disagree with this. When available, I will try to use neutral sources like the UN, but for most of these events I will discuss, there are no such sources. The reason why the United States was so involved in regime changes in this region was the so-called Monroe Doctrine, which basically said that the US was the single hegemon of all nations in the New World. The reason the US was able to project its control over the whole continent was because it was economically more developed than the rest of the Americas. Basically, most American nations were colonies for a long time, and in line with mercantilism, this meant that they couldn't build manufactories or factories. Instead, they sent raw material to a colonizing country and then had to buy the products back from them. This meant that the Latin American nations had no industry and after they gained their independence, they had little opportunity to develop any. This should sound familiar if you watched my video on why Africa is poor. And if you haven't seen it, then wait for the outro, I will link it there. The United States was different to the other American colonies because of how early it got its independence, literal decades before the rest of the continent. So they were industrially more advanced and had more natural resources, allowing them to pretend they owned the entire continent. As such, they did things like take Cuba from Spain or support the independence of Panama from Colombia to be able to build the Panama Canal. 
and of course dozens of supported militarist and terrorist uprisings across the continent spread out over almost one and a half centuries. As you know, in 1945, the Second World War ended with Germany and Europe being split among the state socialist Eastern Bloc and the liberal capitalist West. This quickly led to what we call the Cold War, in which the USSR and the USA were competing for being the dominant superpower in the world. They did this by building many weapons to threaten each other and by proxy wars, in which they would both support different sides in accordance with their ideologies. As such, both the USA and USSR brutally suppressed all movements they considered to be enemies. The United States spiraled into the Red Scare, where people's lives were destroyed over nothing, and the Eastern Bloc saw more than one popular demonstration being crushed by tanks, which incidentally is how America deals with civil rights movements. Because of the combination of the Cold War and the still accepted Monroe Doctrine, the United States hated the idea of a nation in the Americas that wasn't a capitalist nation like the US. Every time a socialist was elected or won a civil war, the United States saw this as an attack on their land, again because they think they own the Americas. So the US would create the pattern of attacking nations with socialist leadership and installing a new government, which was sometimes fascist, sometimes conservative, sometimes liberal capitalist, literally anything but socialist, or the vaguely leftist leaders they sometimes accused of being socialists. So let us finally stop saying vague generalities and get into the specific interventions, which are plenty. In 1917, Costa Rica had a capitalist president who raised taxes on the wealthy. So naturally, the Minister of War overthrew his government and established a dictatorship. And the USA couldn't have that, so they removed the dictator and established a liberal democracy. Sadly, later, by the 40s, as sometimes happens in democracy, a socialist won the election. He did social reform and worked with the Costa Rican Communist Party. This was a very big red flag to the United States, so they immediately funded a rebel movement to overthrow the democratically elected rulers in 1948, the exact year the Cold War started. Because the Costa Rican government had no real military, the civil war only lasted 44 days, but it killed approximately 2,000 people before the leftist president stepped down and the country transitioned to a liberal capitalist democracy with a two-party system. By the mid-50s, Central American nations were practically owned by American monopoly companies, which had been going on for decades. In Guatemala's case, the United Fruit Company, which set up a very corrupt and authoritarian system that benefited nobody but the 1%. So, a lot of workers protested against this system in the first half of the 20th century, which didn't work, but in 1951, and after popular movement actually established democracy, the people elected a new president who did things like land reform and let communist political prisoners out of prison. Naturally, the United Fruit Company was afraid that he may get ideas like minimum wages, so they lobbied the American president to intervene. The CIA picked a Guatemalan in exile and gave him money, weapons and a list of 58 people to execute. Eventually, by 1954, there was a coup that killed about 200 people, and in the aftermath, the US-backed dictatorship would wage a brutal war of extinction against socialists for 35 years, which killed 180,000 people. In 1954, in Paraguay, there was a military coup by a conservative general named Strossner, who declared a state of emergency, banned all opposing parties, and then held an election with nobody but him on the ballot, like a true democratic leader. He implemented economic austerity, which made him unpopular with workers and even some of his generals. So they started rebelling. Some of the rebels were just conservatives who wanted to be in charge, and some were actually socialists. There is not a single source on how many of these rebels were killed by Strassner. But because they were evil communists, the United States sent him weapons, money and advisors to more effectively kill them all. Estimates say about 2,000. By 1989, the US changed their mind and supported a counter-movement against Strossner in his own party. He was removed from his position and in total the regime of Strossner 
and eventually the counter coup killed about 3,500 people. Nowadays, Paraguay is a democratic republic. Cuba has a long history, longer than most in the New World. It was colonized by Spain and remained a Spanish colony until the American government took it over in the Spanish-American War. Eventually, Cuba had its own government, which was very much under the influence and support of the American government. The ruler we care about was called Batista. And even though he was not democratic at all, the US supported him because of business interests. Sadly, the interests of the people and the businesses weren't aligned, so the people eventually supported a communist called Castro. This made Batista start a cruel anti-communist campaign that killed about 1,500 people before he conceded defeat by fleeing the country. This made Cuba suddenly not act like an American colony. So the United States tried to overthrow Castro in the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. That killed about 500 more people. They also reportedly tried to assassinate Castro over 600 times and didn't even succeed once. Cuba would be the only Latin American nation to survive the Cold War without an American-sponsored coup killing everyone. In 1961, the Dominican Republic had a right-wing dictator. The United States didn't like that and supported a plot to kill him, reportedly to install a democratic government. It worked and there were free elections for the first time in the history of the Dominican Republic. But see above, democracies have a pesky habit of sometimes electing socialists. So naturally the people elect a socialist and the USA immediately supported a right-wing coup that later spiraled into a civil war. The United States went in with full force and sent 44,000 American troops into the country, officially to end the war and unofficially to prevent the socialists from taking power again. This killed about 6,000 people and ended when they held an election and the socialists lost, after which they surprisingly stopped the uprising. So then there was a US-backed, let's say authoritarian, that would control the country for another 30 years before it turned into a democratic liberal republic, but only after the American-backed regime killed 11,000 more people. As the second largest nation in the American continent, Brazil has always been of interest for the United States. Because of this, the US strongly influenced many policies in Brazil, but they still had a functioning democracy, and I bet you can see what's coming now. The Brazilian people elected a social democrat. In 1964, the United States under Kennedy were scared Brazil would be, quote, a new China or Cuba. So they went about subverting the will of the Brazilian people and supported a military coup against the democratically elected president. Eventually, the rebels succeeded in their uprising and took power, ushering in a 20-year period in which Brazil was ruled by capitalist military dictatorship. That regime would ultimately kill about 9,000 people, of which most were natives killed in an organized genocide. Yes, sorry, we don't have the time. Between the 60s and 90s, Bolivia saw a lot of military dictatorships and more coups than I can count. Basically, every nine minutes, somebody overthrew someone else. But the United States did not really care as long as these constantly changing authoritarian rulers would be friendly to American interests which they were until 1969, when a socialist took over the government. Naturally, like in all the cases in the two preceding decades, the United States supported a counter coup in 1971 and installed a conservative military officer to rule the country. Curiously, despite being practically a dictatorship, Bolivia still held elections. It was just that after every election, there would be many dozens of coups, none of which were supported by the USA, so we can ignore them for now. In total, the US-supported dictatorship killed at least 500 people. Here comes a more known one, at least in leftist circles, Chile. It was a troubled democracy for most of the 20th century. Basically the same thing every time. Capitalist rulers who thought the way to reduce poverty is to cut unemployment services and such. After a few decades, the people were tired of this, so they elected a socialist named Salvor Allende. Of course, electing a socialist doesn't make an economy socialist. It's much like after realizing you're transgender. There are many things that need to be done to transition. Like nationalist major industry, expand education and improve the lives of the working people, all of which the president did. 
naturally having an open Marxist doing openly socialist things in the Americas was not acceptable to the USA. So they supported a conservative general to start the coup on September 11th, 1973. The coup would kill about 60, which doesn't sound that bad, but the general named Pinochet would rule for the next 20 years, where he would kill about 3,000 people who he had accused of being socialists. The country next to Chile is Argentina, which likewise had a working democracy, which eventually democratically elected a leftist president, this time even a woman, and she allied with the communists and Marxists. So the USA sent support for a conservative military faction in the country, and only two years after she was elected, she was overthrown in a coup. That was in 1976. Following this, a military junta would rule the country for the next years. They would wage a so-called dirty war in which they killed everyone suspected of being a leftist. Numbers vary widely, but about 20,000 people were killed by the Argentine government, all while being supported by the United States. This does not count those who died in the Falkland Wars. Nicaragua had a similar history to Guatemala, meaning most of the economy was owned by American banana companies. At some points, the US even straight up occupied the entire country to maybe think about building a canal there. They didn't, but they thought about it. Of course, since I limited my video to the Cold War, I can't really count the deaths caused by the American occupation in 1912. But just like Guatemala, Nicaragua had a series of American-backed dictatorships throughout most of the 20th century. But in 1978, there was a revolution, and it was a socialist faction that was tired of the entire economy and state being owned by American companies, and the lives of everyone sucking really bad. The people agreed with them, so they took over the government in a coup. Naturally, losing their pro-US dictator in Nicaragua did not sit well with the American government, so they sponsored a counter-revolution which sparked a civil war that killed 11,000 people. Turns out the socialists won the civil war, but the US would not give up yet. Instead, they decided to sponsor the anti-government rebels known as the Contras, who you may recall from a video on the CIA and crack. They killed another 30,000 people over the following decade before dissolving themselves when the socialists lost an election and actually stood down, like they were supposed to do after losing an election. Panama, just like Cuba, is one of those strategic regions in the New World that sparked American interest long before the Cold War. Matter of fact, in 1903, the USA supported a massive independence movement in Colombia, which owned Panama at the time, because they wanted to build a canal there, appropriately called the Panama Canal. Naturally, the USA held control over the area around the canal, because it was very strategically important, and see above, the US thinks it owns the continent. Of course, with time, the people of Panama were kind of angry that all these tolls and taxes which ships pay to use the canal go to the private Panama Canal Company in the US. So eventually, the US negotiated a lot and they decided to give Panama the canal two decades later. But in between them saying they would give the canal to Panama and the day they were actually going to give it to them, something happened. And that was a Panamanian military general taking power. Curiously, he worked for the CIA before he did this, and he did things like be corrupt, support drug smuggling, and threatening to take over the canal from the Americans, which didn't help relations. Then, in 1989, he just annulled the election result after he lost, and the US took this as their cue to invade. Note how this guy was not a socialist, proving that no matter your ideology, the United States will crush a Latin American nation that has any form of self-determination at all. The invasion killed about 2,000 people and ended with the US military arresting the general, flying him to the US to hold a trial, and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison, which was 30 years ago, so he's still in prison in France, officially for money laundering. That's it. That was all the countries in Latin America that saw a US-supported regime change that we know of. But I would be wrong to assume that that's it. Because of course global politics is more than just looking at one country at a time. Oftentimes movements and organizations are larger than that. And one of those was Operation Condor. Very basically it was a US-sponsored alliance of covert agencies, 
like the CAA, like all across the Americas, aka everything in green on here. And they exchanged information about the hiding places of leftists, who they thought were leftists, and so on. They even had the enemies of the military juntas that ruled much of the continent. All this took place between 1968 and 1989, so for most of the Cold War. The death toll is disputed, but it's somewhere between 60,000 and 80,000. And if I was a rightist, I would just add 70,000 to my total here, but there is an issue. Most of these deaths already appeared in my total. Out of these 70,000, 30,000 died in Argentina, of which I already counted 20,000 in the Argentina section. So how much of the death toll of Operation Condor can we add to our total without counting people twice? That's a very hard question. And by looking at the member countries of the operation and the countries we already covered, we see that lots of countries were in Operation Condor and not yet counted, since they had no direct US involvement in their politics. From that, I estimate that about 15,000 people out of the 60 to 80,000 were not counted yet. So there we have it. If we add up all of the numbers, we get a solid 296. 1260. But of course, because of the vagueness of these numbers, and because I only checked them three times, it is fair to say around 300,000. This is about two times more people than the US has lost in all of its wars and interventions since World War II. And that includes these interventions we just discussed. So the Americans barely got their hands dirty. They just paid conservative generals to start coups. Of course, deaths are only a very superficial view at what the American interventionism did to those countries. The conservative policies and military dictators caused much suffering that went far beyond killing people. Some of the things they did to suspected opposition members is so bad that I refuse to say it. Not because of monetization, but because it's just too bad. On top of that, cutting unemployment support, raising taxes on the poor, neglecting infrastructure, education and healthcare, as well as making policy just for the rich people, were all issues in American supported regimes. Of course, people lacking healthcare and dying weren't counted in my numbers at all. Not to mention groups like the Contras who were smuggling fuckloads of drugs, which could and would destroy people's lives. So in conclusion, American interventionism just in Latin America and just during the Cold War killed about 300,000 people and ruined the lives of and possibly indirectly killed way more. Which tells us, well, nothing, and now you have wasted 22 minutes and 45 seconds of your life. The end. If you want to waste more time, please subscribe. And click on screen to watch the Africa video. It should appear while I read out the names of my patrons, who happen to be Darius the Bird, Eric Betts, Harris Hawk, V, Xander Corvus, Alexander Parch, Attila Nemes, Carissa, Daniel Hyman, Dominic Corazelli, Emily Marigold Klaasson, Herdina, Josh C, Klaastrup, Lilith Craft, Mamuka Tilari, Marxism Tonight, Nane Pema, Polk, Raymond Deville, Red Shark Trooper, Sean Murphy, Skylar Magnum Turner, Stemmaster Chef, Taylor CH and Trey.